Welcome to the Yalai meeting. We have meetings here every month. Uh, you're uh, very welcome to all our meetings. Um, this month we have Jan Lester talking upon uh, economic man, uh, which involves uh, a priori concepts, I take it. I don't, I'll hand it over to you, Jan. Right, thank you. Uh, I'll begin by saying a little bit about how I interpret the a priori, a posteriori distinction, because I do it in slightly... Uh, unorthodox way, but a way that I think most critical rationalists would do, which is um, the orthodox interpretation of a priori knowledge or a priori truth is things that you can know independently of experience, not necessarily without experience, but independently of experience. Once in Experience might get you there, but once you've got there, you know that they have to be true. So two and two is four is an a priori truth. There's a cow in the field over there, you say, because you've seen one is an a posteriori truth or knowledge after experience. Now, the way it's traditionally interpreted is that a priori knowledge is uh, utterly distinct from a posteriori knowledge. Something is either one or it's the other, it's completely binary, and only a priori knowledge is absolute and it's justified and you can't have any doubt about it. Now, both of those uh, assumptions as a critical rationalist, you know, following Popper's critical rationalism, uh, I would reject. I would say it's probably more useful to think that there's a sort of continuum between uh, a priori and a posteriori knowledge. And I even read something recently where David Gordon more or less seemed to concede this. He said, obviously, we're taking an awful lot of things for granted, such as the existence of other minds and the external world and whatever. But, so, but given all of those are accepted as true, then these things follow. And I thought, well, that sort of fits. So there's a continuum between a priori and a posteriori. Uh, but also, I wouldn't say that just because something is a priori, it's certain, it's justified, there can't be any doubt about it. It never escapes being a conjecture. You never know what somebody might come up with as a criticism of your conjecture uh, uh, that you were so completely certain of and, and they've, now they've refuted it. So uh, what I'm talking about today is uh, something which I regard as being very much at the a priori end of the spectrum and I can't think of anything that criticises it in such a way that refutes it. But uh, somebody's very kindly uh, furnished me with lots of criticisms as to why I'm completely wrong about this. Um, and I have replied to him at extraordinary length, 16,000 word article, which you will be delighted to know that I've cut down to 6,000 words uh, out of uh, compassion for you and because I don't want you to hate me. <coughs> and I might even um, cut a few more bits out as I go through it. One thing to say about this interpretation of economic man, as it's sometimes called, is uh, something like it needs to be true. Otherwise, I think uh, economics and relevant theories of um, liberty and welfare as as well, but economics in particular becomes uh, a very strange sort of uh, a, a science. It's in a position where if the the instrumental rationality assumption of, uh, of uh, economics isn't true, it becomes like the physicist who was asked to give some farming advice and uh, after sort of many months working on it, he, he came to give his paper and he, he begins, he said, I'm assuming spherical cows in a vacuum. Now, you might have got some interesting conclusions out at the end, but there's no particular reason to think that anything that he said could really matter or that he, what he said could be true except by coincidence. And that's the problem with economics. If you, once you abandon the idea that people are in any way instrumentally rational or that they're, this is a very, very broad brush approach and something really we shouldn't accept it, then economics is in trouble. This is the first time I'm using my phone, and so I expect it to die halfway through. 
so um, this is uh, how I explained the situation at the beginning of chapter two of Escape from Leviathan. The standard modern economic assumption of instrumental rationality holds people to be self-interested utility maximizers. Economists usually intend this to mean egoistic preferences and perfect calculation over time. Insofar as people think this to be unrealistic, it throws doubt on the generally pro-market conclusions of economists. Here we give the assumption of self-interested utility maximization an a prioristic interpretation that may help to reconcile it with Austrian school uh, economics. Uh, Austrian school economics is famously uh, entirely a prioristic. This does not imply egoism and is not trivial. This can be explained more generally. Assuming a central a prioristic theory of instrumental rationality, people are, other things being equal, better, albeit still fallible, judges of their own liberty and welfare. And their empirical choices will tend to reveal their judgments. So if we disagree with their choices, whether those choices are purely personal or proactively imposed on others, then it usually makes sense to reason with them, at least in the first place. Without the assumption of such core rationality, it is common to view people as sufficiently uh, irrational as to make authoritarian paternalism a default assumption. Although this does appear to leave any actual authoritarian paternalists as equally irrational, and that's before considering the limits of knowledge with respect to ruling other people efficiently and the temptations of such power. People are thereby supposed to do all manner of things uh, out, of irrational, out of irrationality, and um, I'm only looking at those things focusing on instrumental rationality, which I'll explain in more detail in a minute. Uh, Ray Percival has written about rationality and the fact that we're all rational at much greater length and in a much broader way in his book, uh, so the myth of the closed mind, is that what yes, it is? Yes, myth of the closed mind. The myth of the closed mind, which he should have called the myth of the closed mind and the open mind. Yeah, uh, the open mind as well, yeah. But he was too closed-minded to do that. <laughs> um, now. Belief in... Uh, this view that people are not instrumentally rational is one important reason that the popularly elected oligarchs of modern states uh, pay only lip service to both liberty. Oh dear, I knew this phone was going to give me trouble. liberty and democracy in order to help legitimize politics, when in reality, both liberty and democracy conflict greatly with their own preferred and jealously preserved oligarchical rule, as well as conflicting with each other. Consequently, if one is defending individual liberty, both as an end in itself and as welfare enhancing, then the hypothesis that people have no core instrumental rationality is a problem, and the hypothesis that they do is a solution. None of this is to imply that people are anywhere near being perfectly prudent or that they do not make many mistakes. I will now go through a few of the critical responses uh, to the second chapter of Escape from Leviathan as put by Danny Frederick in his very, very long article, also about 15, 16,000 words. Uh, and I'll do it by section, and I'll keep the sections as short as possible. In his abstract, he says, Jan Lester defends two hypotheses, that instrumental rationality requires agents to maximise the satisfaction of their wants, and that all agents actually meet this requirement. This is mistaken. The utility maximisation aspect is explained in uh, that chapter as follows. What one has the strongest desire to do, one has the strongest utility at the thought of doing, 
agents aim at the goal, the thought of which gives them the greatest utility or least disutility at the time of aiming at it. In other words, there's no statement or implication that agents are trying to maximise the satisfaction of their wants over time or that all agents actually meet this requirement. Two, instrumental rationality. The a priori theory of economics instrumental rationality, self-interested utility maximisation, uh, that uh, L12, that's Escape from Leviathan, Leicester 12, is defending, can be expressed thus. Everyone has self-perceived interests, that is, desires, wants, valued outcomes, whether egoistic or altruistic. And he or she always attempts to act on the interest that maximises his utility at the time of the attempted action in the circumstances as he conjecturally perceives them to be. Uh, Frederick says the second half of Lester's a priori thesis of instrumental rationality is a hypothesis about agency, namely all actions are instrumentally rational, that this is only by intention under the perceived circumstances. So uh, when Frederick rejects this, he says, we need to add a qualification that agents will act to satisfy their strongest desires provided that the action is possible and he thinks that it is. No, we always do attempt to satisfy our strongest desire in the circumstances as we conjecturally perceive them to be. The action does not need to be possible. Three, weakness of will. That some people are strong-willed and others are weak-willed in terms of determination uh, uh, or willpower uh, is not what is at issue here. What is at issue here is what is known in philosophy as acrasia, which means not acting in the way that one believes to be the best. More centrally, uh, I hold that confusion is avoided by distinguishing levels of desire, want and value. One may have a first level or immediate desire, want, want value in favour of X, but a second level or meta desire one that is against the first level one. And the stronger of the two levels necessarily prevails. So I may desire to eat these fish and chips. I also may desire to get my weight down and whichever is stronger of those two desires is going to be the one that wins. Now, when the first level is stronger and prevails, that is mistaken for weakness of will. That is mistaken for not doing what we think is the best in the circumstances. Actually, we think it is best to eat the fish and chips because that's what we, all things considered, we think is tomorrow is another day, I'll worry about losing weight then. Now, Frederick asserts that uh, my exposition of how weakness of will can be explained is not entirely clear, but he gives no quotation to illustrate this alleged lack of clarity. He quotes the examples of the smoker and the chocolate eater and asserts, this alternative account of apparent cases of weakness of will is not convincing. And this is because Contrary to uh, Lester, the smoker who suffers weakness of will fulfills his desire to continue smoking despite the, facts, the fact that he thinks he would be better off if he did not. Now, this is simply to restate the common sense but paradoxical view of weakness of will, acrasia. The two levels of desire explain away the paradox uh, that a uh, Frederick apparently fails to see, because for Frederick, having a greatest desire for X and believing that not X makes one better off are held to be incommensurable in, uh, phenomena. But desires, or what is wanted, and what is thought better, or what is valued, are often translatable into each other. In some obvious sense, someone must value in some way Sorry, someone must, uh, yes, 
value what he desires and must desire in some way what he values. So it appears to be inconsistent to say, I most desire or want X, but I think it best or most value not X. Hence the paradox of acrasia. We must want what we genuinely think at the time is overall best under the perceived circumstances though we might have changed our mind about our decision in a moment's time or tomorrow. Similarly, says Friedrich, the woman suffering weakness of will feels that life without satisfying that desire, for chocolate in this case, uh, uh, would be better than life in which the desire is satisfied. Again, this merely reasserts the paradoxical common sense view whereby we do not do what we supposedly think it better to do. Frederick asserts, these seem to be descriptions of ordinary facts of life and ones which many smokers and chocolate eaters offer as a description of their situations. But how can these be true descriptions of ordinary facts of life? That is analogous with hearing an explanation of the superiority of heliocentrism, the theory that the Earth and the other planets and stars revolve around the sun, and then saying in response to that, that the sun going around the earth, etc., geocentrism, is one of the descriptions of ordinary facts of life. This ignores the problem and the proffered solution and simply restates the common sense view. Actually, neither geocentrism nor heliocentrism is true, but uh, heliocentrism has more verisimilitude or it would if only we could make good logical sense of that concept. <laughs> F15 then makes an interesting and related suggestion. He said, contrary to Lester, the weak-willed agent might not de desire to be rid of the desire to perform the action he performs. For example, the woman who wants to eat chocolate, even though she most wants to stop eating it. Here, incidentally, Frederick slips into even clearer inconsistency how can one willingly do what one most wants not to do? Frederick continues, her desire to retain her desire to eat chocolate may be stronger than any desire she has to be rid of the desire to eat chocolate. It is true that one can desire to keep a desire that is problematic in some respects. To respond relevantly, we first have to make the second level desire more precise the desire that the first level desire continues but is somehow frustrated. But there is now no direct clash. However, if we can engineer a direct clash, for instance, by pressing this button, that will somehow cause frustration of the first level desire, then we're back with the direct clash again. The agent will only press the button if his second level desire to have but frustrate his first level desire is stronger than that first level desire. Therefore, the second level desire to have a desire but have it frustrated also fits the two level analysis just as well as the desire not to have or to resist as a desire. The apparent paradox of acrasia has been explained away. Four, desires and values. It is not unusual to make a linguistic distinction between desires and values. Desires are often thought of as more basic and more appetitive, while values are often thought of as higher and more reasoned. Thus, desires and values can appear to be quite different and even incommensurable things. But, uh, as I observe in chapter two, to desire something must, in some sense, always be to value it, if only as a way of satisfying that desire. And to value something must, in some sense, always be to desire it, if only as a way of achieving that value. Thus, there is no essential difference or incommensurability that need impede instrument, the instrumental rationality that is being defended. Frederick rightly says, it is, Lester claims, absurd to say that someone is inclined to do something, yet does not have even a prima facie reason to do it. 
and he responds with some examples from Gary Watson's book, 1975, I forget the article, I forget the title. It seems to me that this argument about whether the woman and the man, in Watson's examples, value as well as desire to perform the actions in question is a dispute over linguistic nuance. Uh, to which I would reply that the idea that philosophy is ever arguing about linguistic nuance is false and even philistine. To have a desire for something is ipso facto to value that thing and to have a reason to have it, at least in that respect and to that extent. To deny that there are, are any that, that there is any real value or reason here is to deny the facts. Frederick continues that there's a real distinction behind Watson's more restrictive linguistic proposal. Uh, the woman thinks that drowning her child and the man thinks that acting on his uh, sexual impulses, which examples I didn't give you earlier and probably should have done, uh, would not be objectively good. Uh, in fact, she probably thinks that these, uh, these things are clearly immoral, which is to say categorically undesirable. And this real distinction in a type of desire is thereby not being denied, but rather explained. There is no need to abandon the realm of desires or wants here. Frederick asserts, the man may in some sense value sexual activities, but he thinks it would be objectively bad or wrong to satisfy those desires. Again, he thinks it's immoral and therefore categorically imperative. I'll say more about morality later on. Just skipping a bit. He says, Lester offers a different count. One which evokes, again, the distinction between levels of desire. Uh, that idea was merely mentioned in passing in this context. The main point is uh, that in Watson's examples, the benefits of acting on their desires are really seen as hugely outweighed by the costs. But uh, Frederick ignores this and launches in, into its own levels of desire account that is simply not in uh, chapter two of Escape from Leviathan. Frederick's confusion continues. Lester seems to see all desires as appetites. Uh, but the fact that I have to use appetite in a broad sense on a particular page does not mean that a narrow sense is being denied. All this seems to be another case of Frederick's insisting on keeping conventional distinctions, which I have innocuously analysed in terms of general desires or wants to <coughs> defend instrumental rationality, rather than showing that uh, there is anything wrong with that analysis. Instead, Frederick suggests we must distinguish one, an agent's felt desires, two, things an agent thinks are valuable, three, things an agent thinks are valuable for him, and four, an agent's goals. And all these things can be colloquially distinguished. But that is irrelevant to the problem that I am trying to address, whether instrumental rationality can be defended by explaining all such things in terms of an agent's attempting to maximise his, his desire or want or value satisfaction in the perceived circumstances at the time of the attempt. This is not to imply that they are all illusory distinctions that are completely reducible to the same thing, or that they are equivalent in terms of morals or prudence or importance, etc. And clearly they can be thus explained. <coughs> Uh, Frederick asserts that theories have tended to conflate these four things, but to point out the necessary role of desire or want satisfaction in them all is not to conflate them. By analogy, to point, the, uh, to point out the necessary role of physical competition in different sports is not to try to reduce all those sports to essentially the same sport either. 
Frederick is apparently restricting the meaning of desire or want to something directly appetitive himself. And this seems to be essentialist language policing. In this case, it both disallows an innocuous and useful account of instrumental rationality and entails instead an intuitively incoherent way of describing actions. Five, free will. When I say agents act out of free will in this context, I mean that their bodies move as they choose to make them move. This Hobbesian sense of free will is compatible with someone uh, threatening to uh, shoot you if you do not do what is demanded and so you do it. You still do it out of your Hobbesian free will. Now, um, I suppose that all acts of free will involve agents trying to do what they most desire, want or value. Also, I suppose that an agent's free will cannot escape physical determinism without falling into the randomness of indeterminism. However, this compatibilist assumption, as it's called, is not necessary for instrumental rationality. Frederick tells us that Lester employs a passive conception of agency because agents always perform the actions that he thinks will most satisfy his wants. It is not yet clear how this is supposed to be passive. Also, it is only about attempting to form the action that uh, does most satisfy his wants. According to Frederick, this is not a conception of agency at all because the supposed action is brought about by the agent's motivational factors. The supposed agent does not act, but is rather the passive recipient of impulsions which propel him hither and thither. My account is fully compatible with agents reasoning as carefully as possible about which courses of action they most prefer. Though, of course, you have to first find the idea of uh, reasoning carefully to be your most preferred option. But it is not clear how an agent could possibly avoid ending up with attempting to do what he most desires or wants to do in the circumstances, in the perceived circumstances at the time. To not do that would appear to mean acting without motivation. Frederick continues, how can someone who is doomed always to follow his strongest desire be said to have a spontaneous will of his own? How can we be doomed to being able to try to do what we most want to do, especially as that will include as much reason, reasoning, ambition, morality, self-control, etc., as we want. So what is supposed to be the more attractive alternative? Frederick tells us that this is the sense of free will that is incompatible with determinism, incompatible with the agent's actions being determined by prior circumstances, whether or not those circumstances include desires and valuations. Uh, one thing to mention first is that I do have an extremely brief and speculative account of how intellectual activity might escape physical determinism without falling into randomness in uh, my most recent book. However, that doesn't really appear to be relevant here. Uh, it doesn't really appear to be relevant here which account of free will is right, compatibilist or incompatibilist. It is not about causality, but about the intelligibility of the account. It does not make sense that someone believes that action X is the most desired, wanted, valued at time T, but then intentionally does Y at time T instead. It has nothing to do with causality. Frederick then offers the account that many substantial goals that agents pursue are such that the agent himself pursues them without desiring them or thinking them value. He is merely acting in accord with an inherited theory, doing the done thing. Now, even if someone could do things entirely without desiring them or thinking them valuable in themselves, in any way, at any time, which seems far too general to be plausible, then, in order to have a motive, he must at least desire and value doing the done thing.
Then there's an analogous account. Frederick says, Similarly, many of the things that an agent holds to be valuable will be such that he has never questioned whether they are, in fact, valuable. He merely takes on trust the truth of a theory handed down to him. Again, even if it were possible that someone has never questioned such values in any way at any time, which seems implausible, we do doubt things quite readily, then what someone values he will thereby have a relevant desire or wants about. I'll now skip a very complicated philosophical bit. Six, self-interest. In L12, the interpretation of self-interest as all self-perceived interests is simply explained and shown to be compatible <coughs> with genuine altruism, including by a thought experiment. Every agent perceives that he takes an interest in all manner of things. Some of these are narrowly self-interested, relating to his own pleasure, happiness, status, health, etc. Some of these are interests in the interests of other people, as projects or ends in themselves, relating to family, friends, charities, science, etc. In order to be motivated, an agent must feel utility at the thought of promoting the interests of other people and projects. But these are altruistic to the extent that he would not wish or choose to lose these interests in other people and projects by somehow forgetting them or ceasing to care about them, even if he knew that he would thereby feel more personal utility. Uh, F15, that's Frederick 2015, goes back to abandoning quotation in favour of attempted paraphrase. And uh, in fact, I don't give anything like his amorphous and woolly level account of how people are always and only motivated by their self-perceived interests but are not there by psychological egoists. He, he loves this level account so much he keeps applying it everywhere that I don't apply it and I only really apply it when it comes to um, Akrasia. F15 then concludes to use the same term for different cases slurs over differences that can be important. It achieves a simpler theory, but rather than advancing our understanding, it seems a barrier to it. But this is not replacing all different kinds of motivation with a single one. It is only explaining how these different kinds of motivation can still be self-perceived interests that can fit in the framework of instrumental rationality and utility maximization. Hence, this is advancing our understanding of how these things fit in uh, economic analysis. As an analogy, suppose that the problem were to see how DNA analysis explains all life forms on this planet at least. It would be similarly confused to complain that to use the same term for different cases slurs over differences that can be important as though this would somehow be overlooking the difference between a tiger and a lamb or uh, whatever plant. Of course, uh, Frederick just does reject the possibility of an instrumentally rational analysis of all actions, analogous with rejecting DNA analysis of all life forms. But none of his given criticisms appears to with, uh, understand, uh, withstand the slightest scrutiny. Frederick then says that Lester asks three rhetorical questions. How can we choose to do what we do not, in some sense, prefer to do? Must not the chosen alternative be better for us in some sense? Otherwise, where is the personal motivation? And he asserts these questions, intended as rhetorical, have more or less obvious answers, contrary to those assumed by Lester. Let us see whether these more or less obvious answers withstand scrutiny. First, I can do what I prefer not to do in the sense that I do not value it or in the sense that I do not desire it. This is Frederick. Now, 
let's assume this is supposed to be answering the first question. The first question asks, how can we choose to do what we do not, in some sense, prefer to do? Frederick is, simply does not answer that question. It is completely irrelevant to that question to assert that there is also a sense in which I can do what I prefer not to do. I do not and need not deny that there are colloquial, common and other senses in which we do not do what we prefer. I'm merely making the a priori point that we must in some sense prefer to do what we choose to do and hence instrumental rationality is possible. Of course, if one stipulates, as Lester seems to do, that to act is to reveal a preference, then there will always be a sense in which whatever I do, I prefer to do, but that is trivial. Well, I don't stipulate it. I say it seems to be a priori true. It's a conjecture that it's a priori true. And it doesn't seem to be any more trivial than uh, mathematics is trivial or uh, a priori economics is trivial or game theory is trivial. Second, an agent may choose to do something that is less valuable for him than an available alternative because it is more valuable for someone else. Rather, an agent may choose to do something that is less valuable for him egoistically than an available alternative because it is more valuable for someone else whom he altruistically values more than his egoistic value in this case. In each of these cases, Frederick appears to be trying to, genuinely trying to refute instrumental rationality. It's a bit of a mystery why he does want to refute instrumental rationality, given that he is a libertarian and he seems to have a high view of economics otherwise. Um, but it does seem to conflict with some of his pet psychological and philosophical theories. Third, we often act intentionally without motivation, in that we neither desire nor value what we do. Again, there is some sense in which we neither desire nor value what we do. There are some senses. Those senses would include not feeling an appetitive desire or lust, and having no higher order, second level value, including moral principles. But those senses are irrelevant to the a priori point that intentional acts must, in some sense, be desired or wanted and valued or thought good. Seven, maximization. Agents are explained and defended as utility maximizers in the sense that, <clears throat> that they take to take that they attempt to take the action that maximizes their utility at the time in the circumstances perceived. Frederick quotes me on this and says. As we compare possible choices, we cannot help but take the option that in some way feels to be the most once satisfying. And gives, he gives two criticisms. First, most of our decisions are habitual or conventional rather than reasoned. So what is chosen is the usual rather than the best or the most once satisfying. The first thing to note there is simply is that there's simply no inconsistency between choosing what is habitual or conventional or usual and what is the most once satisfying thing at the time. And therefore, the so is an invalid inference. In fact, choosing in this way is often the most once satisfying thing to do. Otherwise, we would have to say that habits, etc., sometimes bypass our wants and cause our bodies to move like puppets. F15's use of reasoned is apparently intended to imply significant deliberation, but all thought, however superficial, is reasoning in a more general sense of that term. Thus we cannot engage in what is habitual or conventional without having reasoned about what we are doing in that sense. As in so many similar cases with reasoned, Frederick does not capture some narrow essentialist correct usage which uh, refutes instrumental rationality.
skipping on a bit. Morals, eight. My homework. Right. In the second chapter, morals are given a formal interpretation that explains how moral beliefs or sentiments fit instrumental rationality rather than being outside it or conflicting with it. In short, the categorical nature of moral obligations means that when they are genuinely held, they necessarily override all non-moral goals in terms of the utility from keeping them and the disutility from breaking them. And a first important thing to note is that this interpretation of the categorical nature of morals is not necessary for making sense of a priori instrumental rationality. It would be sufficient that different moral obligations were ascribed variable, variable amounts of disutility and that these compete with the disutility of other choices that an agent has. <clears throat> Frederick uh, paraphrases my position and then says, Lester's position here seems to fly in the face of human experience. Uh, this human experience of which Frederick speaks seems on a par with Frederick's earlier description of descriptions of ordinary facts of life. It is the normal, philosophically unexamined way that things are usually seen. <clears throat> Frederick says, I seriously doubt that there has ever been or will be any person who has not, on many occasions, acted in a way that he is, at the time of acting, convinced is wrong. This is emphatically to reassert the common sense position instead of criticising the philosophical arguments that I presented. Which I will not go back into at this time. He concludes, I can recall many examples of my doing things that I clearly thought were immoral. Do the police know? Now, that would mean doing things that, if I am correct in my analysis, Frederick severely, sorry, sincerely believed at the exact time of the chosen action to be categorically impermissible, unacceptable, undesirable chosen actions. How can that make sense? Anyway, in conclusion, I can't see any serious challenge to the idea that people necessarily at any one time are trying to do the thing, the thought of which gives them the greatest satisfaction, desire fulfillment, value fulfillment in the circumstances as they perceive them to be. And therefore, uh, economic analysis can proceed. Without that assumption, economic analysis is in dire straits. It simply has, there are these people with a sort of black box of irrationality there. And then there's supply and demand. And then of course, there's all the macroeconomic theory, which is something politicised and completely really unrelated to things going on at the microeconomic level. So the attack on instrumental rationality in this a priori sense is uh, a very severe attack on uh, microeconomics, which is the best of economics, economics as such, but also it's an attack on the idea that people are able to uh, assess what is actually interfering with their freedom and what actually makes them better off. And uh, I bet you're glad I cut 10,000 words out of that uh, reply to Frederick. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lindsay. Are there any questions or comments? Bob? Is the Freudian slip genuine then? No. 
can you can you do something which looks and then say I didn't mean that. I did, I, I, sorry. Every Freudian slip I sort of tend to hear is just, is just is, there's no, no Freud is bunk, isn't he? I mean, it's just a slip, and it's, it's it's an amusing slip, but I don't think that you're ever revealing your true, true self. Uh, there is a sociologist at um, LSE. He may be still there. Badcock. Uh, Badcock, or as I used to call Freaking him, Badcock. as I used to call him, Evil Venus, and. Uh, he was extremely disillusioned with sociology. He decided mid-career, all sociology is hogwash. And he said, and then, sociology. Uh, uh, hmm? <laughs> Professor of Sociology. And he decided it's all hogwash and he's wasting his life. And he said, then he discovered, he discovered three things. So, uh, I th and I think they were Freudianism, uh, uh, libertarianism, and was the other one game theory? Or so? One out of three. Yeah, anyway, so, well, uh, game theory is okay. Mm. Libertarianism, okay. just Freudism, he's got wrong. And he, and he gave an example of a Freudian slip. And he said his young son ran towards him one day when he got home from work and said, Daddy, Daddy, I want to kill you. And he said, No, I mean, kiss you. And they said, Nah, no. <laughs> he did want to kill me. That's Freudianism in action because, you know, he wanted to kill me and make love to his own mother. Of course he didn't. What <laughs> utter codswallop. I've never heard any convincing example of a Freudian slip. I mean, you might let something out by mistake that you, because you're thinking of two things at once, you think, oh, I mustn't say that. Oops, I've said it. So I mean, I that, it, yeah. you know, then so, the, so in that yeah. sense, you can, have, you can have a slip. But the, you, the, 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 the a priori theory is, uh, now, can you sort of, other than, do anything other than try to do what you think is the best thing for yourself under these circumstances, Mike? And I said, that's, that's, what, e that's what economics needs. But it's also what a theory of liberty needs. Because if people really can't control themselves and we can override whatever they think and, and if, if, if in their own in in the interest of their own liberty and their own welfare uh we can simply say well we'll ignore that because they just they, they simply don't know what they're doing and they don't know what's good for them uh and so it's a sort of uh something that any libertarian i think would want to resist and i don't know many people who say I mean, people sometimes say, oh, you know, I wish I didn't have these desires and whatever, but you, when, you, when you look into it, you know, that's what they like doing, whatever it is. I mean, they drink too much, and they know they drink too much, and they know it's not good for them, but when they do it again and again and again and again, um, you think, that's just what you've chosen to do. It's, you know, nobody's forcing you. Uh, I don't see there's any uh, irrationality here. Um. Well, yes. Was one of your defenses that economics falls apart without this key component? I mean, that's not a defense, right? I mean, that's it's uh, more, of a, oh, it's yeah. more of a reality. That shouldn't be part of your thesis. I mean, uh, um, uh, well, it, it is... Uh, and is that a problem for economics? Uh, that if if this isn't true, I would say yeah. But I mean, it's, can't, why can't you say that economics matters? And we don't, we don't want to say that economics is like assume assume spherical cows in a vacuum. And now, what if that's what you're assuming? Why should we take it, any notice of you? And yet, economics does seem to get lots of good microeconomic results. But Gary Becker does say that it's not that rationality is not essential. No, so, for him not all economists. Becker, for Becker, it's just downward sloping, yeah. Uh, yeah, demand curves, supply curves, you can do it all with that, yeah. I mean, are you saying that all advertising has no effect on humans? Uh, are you saying advertising in somehow appeals to irrationality? Yeah, I think How? What? a lifetime of advertising can make me think I want something. Yeah. Have you ever bought a bra? I you see lots of bra adverts. Yeah, you know, sure. but, but I might buy Coca-Cola when I wouldn't, when it's not good for me, when I don't really want it, when I... You Sorry, know. you buy it when you don't want it. I, I, I believe that advertising has... Do you ever buy Coca-Cola? Not me personally. No, okay. Well, 
I mean, without. I mean, uh, as a mixer, every five years or something. But yeah, you know. Yeah, well. What I'm yeah. saying is, I, I, I Jack Donaldson coach. What's wrong with that? Can have an effect on someone. Yeah. I mean, some of the best advertising is, is the stuff that people don't realize they're buying the product. Yeah, oh, but look, 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 even, if an, uh, even if an advertisement could trick you, and of course, if it could genuinely were tricking you, there would be an element Persuade of fraud. Or, or then, then if it genuinely tricking you, there would be an element of fraud. And, you know, you know, if you say it's one thing and it's another, you know, then that would be fraudulent. But, yes, it can persuade you, but uh, it, uh, in what way are you subjectively not trying to uh, get the best out of the situation. You go into a bar, you want to have something with your whiskey, and you think, I don't mind drinking neat, oh, I don't want to, I'll, I'll have Coke. Coke comes to mind because they've made it easier for you to think of it. Uh, that comes but to mind. But, is... but what, but what, there wasn't, there's nothing irrational about that, is there? I don't know. If you had never seen a Coke ad, you might prefer whiskey stream. Yeah, you might. Yes. If, but uh, the, the um, sort of how adverts work is um, more to do with just giving you yes information that you may or may you not just choose bought to use. Soda that you don't it's really need. Had you never seen the ad, you wouldn't have bought, and is, in my opinion, not actually helpful to the drink. You, you did something that is of no use to everyone but the Coke dealer. But does it diminish your Coke experience? Yes. Does it diminish your experience or make, make your experience better? Uh, that's subjective. Yeah, exactly. Well, so, yeah, so, but the thing is, if you want to have uh, uh, whiskey and Coke, I'm not that, sure. and that's what you've got. It would, it would only apply your argument if you can say, look, they advertised it, now I take a call and now get a worse experience out because they because I, I, I watched this this ad. And that would be an I experiment. If it was the first though. time, it would just be an experiment. Yeah. I won't do that again. Uh, again. Now, if, if you're oh, behaving, if you're really bad. irrational, you'll do it time and time. Oh, why did I buy that Coke again? I forgot I hate it because yes. I see those ads so many times. Yes. You will never forget that you no, hate no, Coke. No, you, you, you do that all the time. You I've imagine. heard people exclaim what you just said many, many times. And specifically why do I keep buying Coca-Cola yes. with my whiskey, well, even though I hate Coke, Coke and whiskey? In there too. I, mean, you know, even more, you know, <laughs> I just find that... Even helps, but I, I, I can't believe you. I can't believe I mean, you've heard many people say that. They do. I can't believe you've heard anybody say that. I ever. have. The case, the case against advertising actually is absolutely hopeless anyway. Advertisers yeah. don't think this way. Entrepreneurs put out onto the market what they think will sell. That is where the saying is. The entrepreneurs guessing what will go. If you advertise something that people don't want, you're wasting your adverts. Let me have a go at this. Yes, Plato yeah. famously said on the on the point of Ecclesia, mm. no man willingly does yes. bad actions. That's right. But that's also a statement of tautology. Basically, he's saying, well, yeah, he wanted to do it at the time. That's all he could do. Now, this attack on the idea, mm. it's basically you're attacking, well, you're not looking at the nature of the philosophy of mind. You're also talking about, effectively, the philosophy of action, yes. which I don't think you know any of the main, main, major work in that area. It's not as simple as you're making it. Man is not a unified whole. So when, when somebody says, oh, I did this because of the advertising industry influence, or I had these friends, and I still do this, you're talking about a separate component within you. The self is a fluid thing. Obviously, the organism did that, and the organism could be said to have done that deterministically. Yeah. This is what you're missing. You're just introducing tautology into an area of analysis which was useful, and then to dismiss the linguist, linguistic uh, analysis, um, the language versions of, of philosophy in the 50s, which, you know, not good for many applications. In, in some of these areas they are. You see my point about Plato, you're kind of reversing his form of tautology, but he was using that as a way of illustration. He wasn't saying this is a theory of mind, uh, and that's the way it is. Well, actually, I think Plato was saying it's a theory of mind, and I, and I think no, I'm agreeing no, with no, Plato. No, 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 no. Plato no, wasn't... Like, no, no, let no, me no, reply no, first. No, let me, let me reply first. The measure of all things, of the things that Yeah, let me reply, and then you can reply to my reply. Hang on, hang on, hang on, you've said so it's, And it's not true by... Then you speak, then you can... So I don't think it's... It's not a definition, it's a theory. And there's a big difference between a definition and a theory, and I think... I mean, Plato... 
Socrates, Plato famously had this theory that there, there was no weakness of will, and he held it as a theory, not as a definition. Um, and it was Aristotle who denied it, and I think Aristotle was wrong. Uh, as for the theories about action, this isn't really about action, because it's about what you're intending to do, not how your bodily movements follow or don't follow really what, what, you're, know, what, what, you're, what, what your intentions are. concept for the ancient Greeks, it was more than but, uh, but anyway, uh, so, so I, 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 deny, I deny it's definitional. I, I say I'm agreeing with Plato, and not, 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 and, but also I think that, that theories of action as such are not really relevant because it's all to do with uh, what's intended rather than how your bodily movements connect with what's intended. Theories of action are actually a separate sort of separate area. You want to add something? No, no. Well, why did you talk over him? <laughs> you shouldn't talk over him. No, no, no. Anyway, yeah. anyone else want to? I could add if you wish, but... Uh, no, you're not supposed uh, to talk uh, over him. I haven't got time for so much. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to say that... Um, uh, thanks. Thank you, Um When you uh, mentioned um, Plato and Socrates, yeah. it just um, makes me still, you know, feel quite, um, you know, ag ag in such you know awe at how these people you know in the ancient Greeks you know four or five thousand years ago or yeah. three thousand years ago whatever it was mm. how they came up with all this information that we still use today still to this day absolutely you know just shocks me so you know just you know, I'm in awe at, you know, but if you if you what well, one answer is um, without belittling them yeah. if you're there first you get the low hanging fruit. So, or, or if you're going to go and start into any a new area of theory, there are going to be some obvious things, and if you're the first person to tackle them, you're going to come up with some fairly obvious theories about them, and people are going to harp back to you. Um, I was listening to somebody the other day saying, you know, if we were to objectively uh, rank uh, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, or whatever, we'd probably, uh, probably we wouldn't rank them as highly as they're normally thought of. It is just that they got there first, and therefore we, we can go back to them, and they get a certain prestige because of that. Um, I think that put, adds a bit of balance, balance to the idea that, they, that, 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 that there were these geniuses, and they haven't been... The whole idea of uh, footnotes to Plato, everything is footnotes to Plato. You know, Plato was the best. Uh, I think it's... No, he was there first, and therefore... He said these things first, and some of the things he said, anybody who got there first would have said something similar, or might have said something similar. Okay. Anyone else? What did he say? Uh, how does free will into this, if at all? Free will. Well, for, for Danny Frederick, he thinks that you, we can't be. People can't be motivated by. Um, doing what they most want, value, or desire to do, it's simply a spontaneous thing that transcends all motivation. I can make no sense of that. I I, the, I, why did you do it? I just did it. Did you, you did it because you wanted to do it? Because it achieved some end? No, no, no. Not because it achieved some end, because that would mean I was being motivated by some desire and no no I just did it he for him that is the essence of um, an act done out of free will I just can't understand it I, I, how could you not be trying to achieve something what however crazy it is I think I'm a fried egg so I'm putting salt on myself <laughs> you're trying to achieve something because you value something, yeah, uh, but for, for Frederick, he 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 says that's one. Of the, I think that's one of the main reasons he rejects the idea that people are instrumentally rational because he wants there to be something, a pure, free will that completely escapes all motivating phenomena. And I said, I, I just can't make sense of it. I said, not so much that I think that it's false, but I'd, I'd like someone to explain to me how that could even be possible. It's in such something, sorry about this, yeah. jump in. The actually unmotivated act, as it were. By the same problem with him. Yes. I, mean, I, I have thought occasionally, not regularly, but I could pick up the, a baby in its carriage and throw it over the bridge. 
Oh, that's the imp of the perverse, isn't it? And um, yes. how wicked that would be. Yes. yes. So yeah, I don't do it. Perverse, yeah. <laughs> but I could. Yeah. And in a sense, I probably couldn't. Yeah, and, 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 and yet Unless it was saving you know, ten thousand lives. And yet there is a motive. Certain. And yet there is the, and yet there is a motive there. Sometimes we we get the imp of the perverse. Of it, which, which, Edgar, Edgar, Edgar Poe. Edgar Poe. Well, yeah, it, it whispers in our ear. You, you know, you could do something really bad now. It, it suggests you. And of course, yeah, you usually you dismiss it and you don't because it clashes with your other values. Occasionally, you might think, I could just step on that ant. For the hell of it, and then maybe you do. That's only an ant, and uh, so it's, it's still, you still. What you? I think born in war. You had a reason for re you had a reason for doing what I you. I think were, born in water on a wasp nest is far more rewarding. Oh uh, yes. Well, I once poured oil all over a wasp nest and set fire to oh, the wasp nest. Wow. Oh, I was a young boy. A, young boy at the time. Called an unnatural parent. Yes. Yeah. Desire. Yeah. Uh, in the Socratic tradition, uh, uh, after the Socrates, uh, Socratic tradition uh, divides the six uh, six school. This uh, di uh, divide uh, division in the only desire uh, topics. One school argued that uh, because desire is the not the only things, is the little bit related to the virtue. Mm. Uh, when we Create. I am a medical doctor. I study yeah. the desire at the body. Mm. I wrote. Uh, I have written the, uh, around the ten years. I have studied uh, 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 around the ten years about the how can uh, create the desire on the mind in the body. Yeah. How can uh, desire shape the body? Yeah. But my basic the inspiration from the really philosophy, mm -hmm. I'm a medical doctor, but philosophy is very important. Yeah. After the Socratian tradition, for instance, Epicurean school yeah. argued that if we can uh, satisfy the old desire, we can uh, reach the uh, virtue. Uh, Cynic school, for instance, uh, yeah. argued that uh, if we can uh, uh, dependent uh, or uh, independent or desire, mm. we can uh, reach. We can reach the uh, virtue. I think uh, it, uh, desire in the explained different way. Uh, a desire is the not only determinate all life in the, uh, the, uh, with the relation to the. Uh, environment to the relation to the market to the relation shopping desire sometimes you can control the old desire uh, response you know yeah but it, the only way you could control some of the more appetitive desires the, 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 the for food and drink <laughs> the only way is by having um, a higher desire to control those desires or having what uh, David Hume called the uh, the quiet passions, the, 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 which are the sort of desires and appetites of the intellect. Curiosity is a desire. It's a, a des the desire to know. Uh, so, uh, if instrumental rationality is true, then however high you go, you can never escape there being some sort of a desire that's controlling the others, even if it's just the desire to find the truth of uh, some theory in physics. You, uh, you can't leave desire behind. It, desires can compete with each other and help to regulate each other, but the idea that you can step back from desire and simply operate without it, it uh, I can't understand that. I can't make sense of that. And uh, a priori instrumental rationality seems to show that that doesn't make any sense either. I'm not sure how far that is an adequate response to what you said. But. Do you okay with that? Dominic, do you want to come back? Yeah, there's more uh, what you were talking about before that, that earlier question. Mm -hmm. um, my own views on um, the philosophy of action is, is it's unclear what your actions are. In a sense, 
or what people I think you argue you you um, advocate for what are your deeds that's how you get these anomalies and you say you effectively say well I did that I wanted that drink this means now I drank a lot you basically say I'm not the person that I was then I've changed myself the self is a construct that's why it's got so much fluidity if you start applying and they received ideas about determinism to what we call the self, you're going to get, you're going to get into immediate problems. I'm not sort of very keen on this sort of reification of the, uh, the mind as the self. I, I, I quite like this sort of straightforward idea that you're a biological organism, that's what you are. And, you know, you have a certain beginning and maturation and degeneration and then finally cease to be now at any stage you we do. will hmm? well no, yeah. no. Don't tell me. <laughs> and uh, but at any stage you change the sorts of things that you like to do I mean that's not becoming a different person that's just you changing your habits uh, yeah. you know, I think that, I think that's just a, a different description of, of, of the same organism, I, and, I, and I think that level of description I'm talking about is part of our practice. To, to say you don't like it, you know, it's, a, it's a real thing, and, and that, that's so. What's a real thing? Say, yeah, it's quintessential to what we are as humans. What the fact that we can change our habits? No, the, the fact that, that we, if you like, model ourselves and say, "This is what I am." This is what I would rather have done then. This is the sort of person I am now. Oh yeah, I mean, in terms of uh, character, you can, yes, you can, but you, you don't become a different person just because your character changes. You're the same person in a sense of a human being who is, a, who is capable of a certain level of self-reflection. That's what a person is. Uh, uh, your character that you can modify it and become better or worse it doesn't it, mean that you're a different person than well, you were we don't before. We use that in our language. We don't actually talk about that. But I think yes, I think you can become a different person. I would say. I would say, even if it were true that your your personality could change significantly, and uh, uh, I think that's. I mean, for, uh, you could be, in, you know, inverted commas, a bad man, and then you. By following Aristotle's advice, you, you act the good man until it becomes second nature and you become a good man. Uh, uh, you'll simply, uh, it doesn't make, it seems perverse to, to say that you're now a different person than what you were. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's um, just a, an exaggeration, it's just hyperbole to say you're literally a different person. No, you're not, you're the same person and you've just got out of some bad habits and you've got into some good ones. Of course you're the same person. And if we ever catch you for what you did before, you're in trouble. No, no, yeah. no, 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 I think, no, no, You can't say, oh, that was no, no, somebody is else. A category mistake. You're using the word person there as an indexical, and it can be used as an indexical, and that's not the way I'm using it in, the, the, in what I said about it. Mm.